So I want to thank everybody for coming to this uh, very special uh, you know, version of the, uh, the patient is in. And as those of you in the Coke community know, we often have this series called The Doctor is In. And this is one where the real star of the show is not the doctor by far, but definitely the patient. And some of you who may have come to the uh, With Insight event has, have heard uh, um, Stephen talk. And it is, I think, a great advertisement for basic science. It, it was very inspiring for me personally in terms of the power of cancer research. And I know after hearing him talk about um, his experiences, I was like, wow, we really have to get back in the lab and do more stuff and do it fast. Um, what I thought I would do to start is just give you guys a very quick sort of tour through the science of IDH mutant cancers, the rapidity with which they were discovered and sort of some of the ways the insight was figured out just to set the stage of what he's going to talk about. And so I will try to be very brief. But basically, this is a story that dates to 2008. It's really a, a fantastic uh, um, you know, example of basic science discovery and all of its different ways. And so this really came out of sort of um, sequencing efforts and genomic analysis of, of, a, of a glioblastoma. And what was found, published in this uh, science paper from the group at Hopkins, was is that they found IDH mutations in gliomas, and this seemed to define a clinically distinct subset, as you can see here from the data shown in the original paper. Now, at the time, I can tell you that they had no idea what this means. They called up my former uh, PhD advisor, because he knows something about cancer metabolism, and like, what does this mean? And they had no idea, but it was very clear, because then even uh, later, uh, a few months later, in the New England Journal, it was published in a much larger data set that these really do seem to be quite common in various low-grade gliomas, particularly uh, um, grade two and grade threes of specific subtypes. We don't need to get that deep into the science. But again, as you can see here, much larger data sets, clear distinct natural history of what happens with these, arguing that this is really defining a different um, disease within glioma. So now, we can talk about that later. There's actually all kinds of interesting things about like that, but I, I think the clear take home from this is, is that this is a separate disease um, that's defined by this mutational status. Um, it was later found that this was not just glioma, that it was also found in, in leukemia. So also this is later in 2009 when a group at Wash U, while uh, sequencing AML, found that it was uh, present there. And then since then, a number of other tumors have found out that with varying frequency, that this is a mutation that exists across various tissues and disease contexts. And this sort of led to a lot of excitement about, oh, what is this? What does this finding really mean? Now, what was known is that in almost all cases that this happened in one of two genes, IDH1 or IDH2, but always it was really mutation of a single residue, R172 and IDH2. Later it was found there's another residue in IDH2 as well, and IDH1 was a synonymous residue, R132, and there's sort of distinct features that have to go. IDH1 is always in glioma, IDH1 and 2 in some other diseases. And this sort of led to a lot of confusion about what what does this really mean? And the way people first thought about it really came down to that there was a couple other rare um, cancer syndromes that had to do with mutations in other TCA cycle enzymes. So IDH, isocitrate dehydrogenase, if you've heard of this before, you've probably heard it because I in 705 or someone in your biochemistry class made you memorize the TCA cycle and this was one of the enzymes you had to memorize. Well, it turns out two other ones have mutations as well. And those had been sort of couched in the HIF signaling pathway. Many of you are probably familiar with this, beautiful work from Bill Kalin at Harvard, and other labs have really figured out how do cells sense oxygen, and this is one way that they do it. And the key way that they do it is that there's a reaction through these dioxygenases that end up marking the HIF protein with a hydroxyl group in the presence of oxygen that leads to its degradation. It's a transcription factor. But the key thing to get from this is that there's biochemistry, alpha-ketoglutarate, is a substrate for the reaction that tells you oxygen's there, succinate is a product. And so the idea was is that if you have mutations in the TCA cycle that lead to increased succinate, they mess up this signaling and you get this sort of this pseudo hypoxia phenotype. And so the idea was, well, 
IDH mutations make alpha ketoglutarate and so maybe they don't make enough alpha ketoglutarate and it's the exact same thing over again and in fact you could show this, this was actually from the New England Journal paper showing that these are loss of function for the production of alpha ketoglutarate and what we normally think of what you learned as the IDH reaction in, uh, in your biochemistry class. And in fact there was a science paper published that I won't highlight because it turned out to not be right but really argued that this was the mechanism. Now I think the first clue that this wasn't quite right really came from the observation of really the genetics and you guys are all good scientists. If someone came to you and said, here's mutations in a very limited number of residues, in fact, the same residue in two different synonymous proteins, you wouldn't conclude loss of function, right? You would conclude something about gain of function, but I just showed you the data that everything you think the enzyme does is gain of, is loss of function, right? They, we measure the enzyme activity and it seems to be loss of function. Now, the thing is here is that what you have to realize is that if you go back to basics, enzymes don't catalyze reactions in one direction. Enzymes catalyze reactions in both directions. They have to. That's laws of thermodynamics. And it turns out the mutations are actually in IDH1 and IDH2. There's a third isoform, IDH3. And what's special about IDH1 and IDH2 is that there was literature that these could be reversible under physiological situations. And yet everyone looked in the direction of what you learned in your biochemistry class. And when one looked in the other direction, that is, could it catalyze a reduction event, you found that they were actually gain of function for catalyzing something to do with reduction. And here's some data um, showing that. And to understand sort of what this means, because this is how it was really figured out, once you knew it was catalyzing a reductive reaction, you realized that what you had is you have a situation where the IDH can actually be broken into two different components of the reaction. One is taking the CO2 on and off that interconverts six carbon isocitrate and five carbon alpha ketoglutarate, labeled here as two oxoglutarate from Bill Kalin's nomenclature. Um, and the reduction, oxidation reduction reaction that changes this uh, um, sort of hydroxyl group on the top there to a ketone. And so what happens was is that those mutations, all the mutations that were happening were actually in this arginine residue that was coordinating the CO2 group coming on and off the enzyme. And so it might make sense that if you mutated that arginine residue, you'd be able to carry out the oxidation reduction component of the, of the reaction without putting the CO2 back on. And so if you catalyze the reverse IDH reaction without adding the CO2 back, you don't get isocitrate, you get this molecule that at the time no one had ever heard of, 2-hydroxyglutarate, which is interesting because this is a metabolite that's not normally there in a lot of cells. And what the paper said happened is you look by mass spec and you find it. But the real thing was, is it was actually figured out based on sort of thinking about it and the way I just told you about it, even though the way the paper was ultimately written was it was found by, by metabolomics. Now the cool thing about this is it actually accumulates to ridiculous levels in the brain. So these is human glioma patients. And you can see that's a log scale. And this 2-HG accumulates to very high levels. And of note by the old mechanism, there's really no change in alpha ketoglutarate, at least that was discernible here. And so this really changed the thinking about what these enzymes do, because it says that what these IDH mutations really do is that they're a gain of function to make this metabolite 2-HG that's normally not there. And this has important consequences for how one might think about you taking advantage of this for therapy, as well as a way to perhaps monitor cancers. Now you'll hear about monitoring later, but I think there's also a lot of excitement about a drug target. If this is a gain of function, it can now be a drug target. There's a lot of evidence out there that this is something that happens very early in the disease process. People are interested, we can talk about what that evidence is. And the best thinking is, is that the way this works is that by accumulating very high levels of this metabolite that's not supposed to be there, it interferes not just with the oxygen sensing HIF reactions, but actually with the large family of these um, alpha ketoglutarate dependent dioxygenases, which are very important regulators of epigenetics. And it's thought much more that it's the epigenetic targets that affect this. And there was a series of science papers in 2013, if people want to look at this, that really argues that what this 2-HG production does is impairs the differentiation of cells and that that seems to be the mechanism of transformation. And what people have found is that in emerging data from leukemia that 
inhibitors of these drugs actually appear to be working. That is, they seem to relieve the differentiation block in AML, and they've had complete responses in several patients in phase one, which for the non-clinicians here um, is something that one does not see very often. Now, the other thing which you'll hear talked about in Stephen's story is the use of 2-HD to monitor cancer, and that the fact that this is building up to very high levels, and it's made by the mutant enzyme, says this is a perfect biomarker for what's going on with this disease, either to ask, are you actually inhibiting the enzyme for therapy? Or even just more generally speaking, is there tumor present? Because if there's tumor present, it should be making 2-HG. And some work that we've been involved with with the group at, at, at MGH has sort of looked at this, and that is this levels of this, enzyme, of this uh, 2-HG are high enough that you can look at it by MR spectroscopy. And there's some challenges in doing this, but they're sort of now beginning to you know, use this to really look at downstream sort of therapeutic response. Um, here's a patient with surgery. You can see 2-HG present, had the surgery, 2-HG goes away. And I can tell you the with Insight event, Stephen talking about this actually being used in his clinical care, um, I have to say was a pretty cool uh, feeling to feel like you know, see something really translated that, that rapidly into really making decisions. And I, I don't want to take up any more time. I work with great people. I don't want to do that because the real star of the show is Steven. And so I want to give him plenty of time to come up here and really tell you his story, um, which I personally have found incredibly inspiring. So please, Steven.